Welcome back Clinical Problem Solvers. My name is Brian and I'm a second year internal medicine resident at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. I am very excited to share our schema for dyspnea with you today. So dyspnea is the subjective sensation of uncomfortable breathing and it commonly results from problems in the cardiovascular and pulmonary systems. And before we get into this schema, I'd like to make two quick points. The first point is that the cause of dyspnea can often be readily identified just with a careful history and physical. For example, how a patient describes their breathing discomfort can often give us insight into the underlying pathophysiology. And the second point is that dyspnea often has multiple etiologies, and it's not uncommon for a patient to have more than one problem contributing to their breathing discomfort. Now this schema characterizes dyspnea into three buckets. The first bucket is cardiovascular causes of dyspnea, the second bucket is pulmonary causes of dyspnea, and the third bucket are causes of dyspnea not due to primary problems in the cardiovascular and pulmonary systems. And there's a few subcategories within this bucket. And one caveat I'd like to share with you right off the bat is that dyspnea is an extremely broad topic, and this schema is meant to serve as an introduction to the most common causes without being all-encompassing. So let's go ahead and get started with cardiovascular causes of dyspnea. And within this cardiovascular bucket, we have the myocardium. Examples being heart failure, coronary artery disease or acute coronary syndrome, and valvulopathy, such as aortic stenosis or mitral regurgitation. And this category is typically associated with impaired ability of the ventricle to either fill or eject blood. Next, we have the pericardium with examples being constrictive pericarditis or tamponade. And in this category, increased pulmonary vascular pressures is typically what leads to dyspnea. And I'd like to share one clinical pearl with you all that Reza had shared with me, and that's that patients within this category can present clinically with heart failure. However, their pro-BMP may not be elevated because the ventricle itself is unable to stretch within the pericardium. And then the final category within this bucket is electrical. And here we have tachyarrhythmias or bradyarrhythmias, which can both manifest in dyspnea. Our next bucket of causes of dyspnea are pulmonary etiologies. And I find an anatomical approach to be quite useful in this case. And I always like to start with the airways themselves. And examples here being asthma, COPD, or bronchiectasis, which is thickened airways from infection and inflammation. Next, we have the parenchymal category, and this is a broad category, and one example I'd like to use is interstitial lung diseases. Next, we have the alveoli, where filling processes can often lead to shortness of breath, and those filling processes can occur because of water, pus, or blood. Pulmonary vasculature, such as pulmonary embolism, pulmonary hypertension, vasculitis, and hepatopulmonary syndrome can often lead to dyspnea. And the one pearl I love about hepatopulmonary syndrome is that it can be associated with platypnea. And platypnea is dyspnea when upright that actually improves while supine. And the last category here is the pleura. And examples are pleural effusion or pneumothorax. Our final category, or our final bucket rather, are those causes of dyspnea not due to primary problems in the cardiovascular or pulmonary systems. And here we have problems with the chest wall, where reduced chest wall compliance is what leads to dyspnea, and examples being kyphoscoliosis, obesity, and flail chest. Within our neuromuscular category, we have myasthenia, Guillain-Barre, and ALS. And these patients often exert near maximal inspiratory effort just to produce a normal negative pleural pressure, and this often leads to them feeling short of breath. And then the hematology subcategory includes anemia. And in anemia, we have impaired O2 delivery leading to dyspnea. And one thing that's important to note here is that these patients will often have a normal oxygen saturation. And the oxygen saturation just measures the proportion of red blood cells whose hemoglobin is bound to oxygen, not the total amount of red blood cells. And finally, our other category, here we have acidosis, where you typically have tachypnea to reestablish pH, hyperthyroidism, which in and of itself seems to find its way into a lot of our schemas, anxiety, and deconditioning. And one 
important thing I like to always mention about anxiety is it's often important to figure out whether the anxiety is preceding or following the dyspnea, because that could be very clinically important. So to summarize, I want you to remember that the cause or causes of dyspnea can often be readily identified with a careful history and physical. Dyspnea often has multiple etiologies, and it's not uncommon for patients to have more than one problem leading to breathing discomfort. And then finally, dyspnea is categorized into these three buckets, cardiovascular causes of dyspnea, pulmonary causes of dyspnea, and causes of dyspnea not due to a primary problem in the cardiovascular pulmonary systems. And subcategories within this bucket include chest wall disorders, neuromuscular disorders, hematologic processes such as anemia, and other miscellaneous causes such as acidosis or hyperthyroidism.